Hello everyone watching and listening. We're on day four of the Exodus seminar. I brought a number of people together to walk through Exodus, partly in preparation for a series of public lectures I want to give next year. I'll just briefly introduce everyone and we'll jump into Exodus 7 because that's where we closed off yesterday. On my right is Jonathan Paggio, Stephen Blackwood, Dennis Prager, Greg Hurwitz, James Orr, Oz Guinness, and Douglas Headley. A uh, very good collection of thinkers and, and uh, raconteurs. And uh, we'll jump right into the, to the text again, Exodus 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And a mysterious part of the text, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. So God, in some sense here, is revealing a, an overarching plan that's going to cause a fair bit of trouble for both the Israelites and the, and the Egyptians. Well, certainly in the Pharaoh in the meantime. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. And Moses was fourscore years old and Aaron fourscore and three years old when they spake unto Pharaoh. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron saying, when Pharaoh shall speak unto you saying, show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did so in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Now there's an echo there. I want to talk about the hardening of the heart issue, but there's an echo there in 7.12. Aaron's rod is the staff of Aaron, the tradition of Aaron. It's, 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 it's power and state, in some sense, handed down from God through Moses to Aaron, and the idea that that rod devoured all the serpents and rods that the Egyptians could produce is an indication that that tradition and power is superordinate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, and what do you so what do you make of that, Jonathan? What do you make of the again of the hardening of the heart? Because it's a tricky part of the text, right? It's like, well, why would God make the Pharaoh even more tyrannical than he otherwise would? when he could do the opposite in principle. Well, I think, first of all, you've got it right. I think that that's exactly what hardening of the heart is. Because we have to understand the idea of the heart. The notion of the heart is the center, the center of the person. Remember when Moses put his hand out and then brought it back to the middle and bringing it back to the middle was the healing of the hand. And so the idea of hardening of the heart is very interesting because... It's hardening the center. It's right, it's right, exactly. We tend to think of the center as being good, and, and many, we're right, but there's a manner in which the center, the, the identity of something, can become tyrannical. Mm -hmm. So in hardening of the heart, then we see the Pharaoh become more tyrannical. It helps us see that that's what it is. It's actually... It's, so the, the, what the, the Pharaoh would need would actually be of some water, would be the, a bit of snake, a bit of flexibility for his, for to be able to see the change that's coming. But because his heart is so hard, he can't see what's going on. Right, right. So he that, won't change. That, that is very reminiscent of a totalitarian that's structure. That's right, exactly. Right? So yeah. that, that the so borders. Th there's another, uh, oh, do you want to say something? Go ahead. All right, so the, uh, there's another different uh, read on, on the hardening, which, by the way, is all, alternates with strengthening. The, the, both verbs are used. He strengthened Pharaoh's heart and hardened Pharaoh's heart. 
And I accept the following explanation, which I think was first given by Maimonides, not by me. Uh, I would like credit for it, but I can't take it. By doing this, God gave Pharaoh freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. If I twist your arm and then you do what I asked you to do, you didn't do it willingly. Right. So even the tyrant is allowed by God to have his freedom of choice. Absolutely. So God strengthened his heart and did, did not make the plagues the reason that Pharaoh did what he did. He made him strong enough to withstand the plagues and do what he really wanted to do, which is not allow the Israelites wow. to leave. That makes so much more sense. Doesn't it? It makes sense no, because the, the heart is the seat of the will. Uh, in, in, in Hebrew thinking, is the seat of the mind as well. So that, that fits nicely. It goes with the center idea right, as well. Right, right. So it's not as if God is overriding Pharaoh's will, but guaranteeing it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So he's going to let the tyrant play out the role of tyrant fully. Yes, some and rabbis say he's the top, Pharaoh is at the top of his game. Mm -hmm. Till the end, oh, right, right? Okay, and that there's, sets so there's up that element the sort too. of cosmic elements of the full contest. Right. So, okay. But to so back then, up John's point, you also have. I mean, the Pharaoh hardens his heart in the first five plagues. It only says the Lord does it in the last five, mm -hmm. not in the first five. Well, I guess in other words, by that stage, he needed help to have a have a strengthened heart. Judgment then. is partly people being left to the consequence of their own right. settled sure, choices. Sure, sure, sure. I think Augustine sure. says something similar, doesn't he? He says, you know, I, I, the God hardens Pharaoh's heart just means God shows how hard Pharaoh's heart really is. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what well, it, it reveals his true it, will. It also makes sense that if this story is going to have an archetypal role in some sense the tyrant has to be the real thing, right? And so he's really tyrannical to begin with, and then like tyrants, he actually doubles down, which is exactly what they do. And so if he wasn't like super tyrant, this wouldn't be the ultimate story of, 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 of freedom from tyranny. And so well, from a sense. straight narrative perspective, it's not that interesting if he's, you know, immediately won over by frogs. Right, it's like there, oh. there has to be a process, right? Given or the course, by a deus ex ma ma machina. Yeah. Right, I mean, given given the the degree and extent of his sort of deprivations or his his dehumanization mm -hmm. uh, of the Israelites, there has to be a process. It can't it can't be easy, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. I have a very quick question. What, does anyone know? And I imagine this is a Dennis question. Why why are some of the verbs? italicized and, and the nouns, I mean, just specific words are italicized in the text and others aren't, and it seems somewhat arbitrary. Does anyone have an explanation for that? Show me, that would be in the King James, Is right? It? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm using, uh, so give me an example of an italicized. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. The is is italicized. Yeah. That's very, um, I, there, he, there he must says, be a reason that they take thy rod and cast it, it before Pharaoh, the, and yeah. it shall become a servant. I know a little bit about 17th century go ahead. Uh, yeah. italicization. It really has no rhyme or reason to it. I mean, that's that's, <laughs> that, that's the I, best I, answer yeah. possible. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know. I've, it looks I, like an overwrought screenplay. <laughs> like if you're an amateur screenwriter and they put uh -huh. everything in caps, like to make the action verbs but, more but action think but, yeah. Or a YouTube commenter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can that's tell right. this is important because it's in caps and it's bold, plus their exclamation points. And exclamation marks. points, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. The emojis are also puzzling, but we can deal with that. There's also a sense, I think, in which, you know, in, in, the, in the largest sense, you know, the hardening of the heart in, in verse three, uh, I harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. So it's, it's, it's Pharaoh's hardening of his heart that you might say allows for the glory of God to be shown forth. Mm. And in a certain sense, if what's being revealed to the Israelites is, 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 you know, God as the the fundamental principles of the real itself. What it means is that there's, yeah, the the there's no, the there's no resisting that. I mean, it's and of course we know that their hearts are hard. I was just we were just talking about COVID a second ago and the insane COVID regulations, the ramping up of these things. But it's not as though those things happen without consequence, right? I mean, those things as those things are themselves subject to the re, to the deeper order according to which you know we will judge them, whether we're shuttered to the theaters or the economy tanks or whatever. So yes. You can harden the heart and double down and ramp up the regulations, but not also be immune f from the deeper structures to which you're subject. Well, Jordan, it's, it's, there's it's another. It's, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, verse seven. Before we pass on, I, I love the Hebrew sense of time, 
And here you have this wonderful Moses was 80. Now, <laughs> John could tell us the significance of 80, but what's significant for me is that in the scriptures, the heroes are often introduced with their age at the very moment they do the thing they're called to do. So Joseph is described as 30 when he stands before the Pharaoh and everything is built up to that. And here's Moses now, he's before the Pharaoh, he's 80. Now, you could tell us the significance. I'm not sure what the symbolism of 80 is, but I know for sure there's an interesting, many of the characters are quite old, and it's pretty astounding to have Abraham be so old when the story is happening. You almost have to remind yourself of how old they are when you're reading the story, because you know, what Moses is doing is not what better, you imagine an 80 year old. Is it better late than never? Is it something like well, that? Well, I think in the case of, of Moses, there has there's that whole process of 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 escaping Egypt. He you can understand that in a way Moses goes through a process personally of what then Israel will right. go through yeah. later. He's like a little microcosm right. of the whole story. Right, right. But I, the one thing that I want to point out in terms of the hardening of the heart as well, which interesting enough, because one of the structures that I've been seeing in this in this in this text is also related to the Tower of Babel. Because the, the plagues are an undoing of creation. We'll look at it. There are other aspects to it, but one of them is definitely an undoing of creation. But before that, there comes the, the tyranny. There comes the, and there's something about the fact that in the Tower of Babel, you know, God comes down and says, like, they're going to do their will. And then God undoes it. And that you see that something like that. It's like, well, the Pharaoh will do his will, but it's not going to succeed because right. his will is so tyrannical that it actually calls upon it's brittle. It becomes brittle ultimately. The, un the other thing for me that's so interesting with the rod swallowing the other rods, right? Of, of showing the the dominance of the of of the Israelite God, but the pl the plagues themselves are like from a narrative structural perspective. What's so amazing is is they individually decimate all the Egyptian gods symbolically, right? Because all of the plagues are tied to an Egyptian god of one sort or another. So like the rod swallowing the other rods. Right, it's, it's, he comes in and that's another reason why the heart has to be strengthened or hardened because it has to go through and clean out all the other gods, right, one by one. It's a great, it's a great so it's sort a, of... So it's a re-representation of the idea of the battle of gods in heaven and the emergence of the, of, the, of the dominant god, so to speak, a movement towards monotheism. So, and you get this, this uh, foreshadowing here again that um, even though the Pharaoh can call on his wise men like God has called on Moses and Aaron, and even though the wise men and the sorcerers and the magicians can bring out the rods and turn them into serpents, which in some sense means Pharaoh can call on a power that's equivalent to the power God can call on, then God trumps him with the victory of Aaron's rod over... It's a deliberate the, parallelism. It just mm -hmm. illuminates by contrast the strength and, and glory of, of God. Right. Well, they, also not demeaning the Pharaoh. It's right. like he's got some tricks yeah. too, and yeah. they're not trivial. Yeah. So. yeah. And that'll go on all through the plagues. You see the same structure where the magicians actually perform the same plague. Mm -hmm. So it, it, yeah. it's definitely in there. But only in the first two. Yeah. And then after that, it's like they run out of steam. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, I'm mean, we're jumping ahead of it, but they drop out with the gnats and the fleas. And again, That's some of the rabbis... That's a good time to leave town. No, well, the rabbis say uh, Egypt is monumental. Gigantic statues, incredible pyramids. What they're beaten by is a flea. Mm. <laughs> the Lord's That's joke. Right. Yeah. Another of the Lord's there's jokes. A love, there's oh, oh, there's oh, a great oh. joke coming up, and I'm like, okay, I'm okay, waiting. Okay, okay, good, but good, I just well. want to make one point about... Uh, I didn't want to interrupt while you were reading. Uh, very, very important, in my opinion, it says, and, and Aaron will be your prophet, mm -hmm. right? You just read that. So I don't know why it happened, but it was a terrible mistake. And I love King James Version. I'm glad you're using it. I love it. And that is, the Hebrew does not mean prophet. The Hebrew means spokesman. And I don't know why prophet was used. Prophet conjures up person who tells the future. That's the last role, basically, of prophets. They're all God's spokesmen. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly here. He's not going to be a prophet. He's going to be the spokesman. Mm -hmm. So just know that. It's, it, it's, the Navi is the Hebrew word, and it doesn't mean one who tells the future. It means right. spokesman. 
Yeah, but I think in most Christian traditions, we, we, there's a more subtle understanding of what a prophet is as well, because even we know that the judges yeah. are prophets, that, that it's just basically people who manifest the will of God in the yeah. world. Right, so it's more spokes- vernacular. Right, but has yeah. spokesman been used always yeah. rather than yeah. prophet? Well, prophet, right. it would be right. more accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. prophemi in Greek, I think, means to literally yeah. just speak out, to proclaim. Yeah, and so maybe that was how the confusion crept in. Oh, that's interesting. In. Yeah, oh. prophet. So it doesn't just mean a predictor, but one who declares, speaks out, it speaks It became forth. predictor, but... But it wasn't That's original. Right. That's, That's right. good. I'm yeah. glad to know that. Yeah. Okay. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out unto the water. So that's Moses' domain again, the water. And thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come. And the rod which was turned to a serpent, shalt thou take in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And so we get that parallelism we talked about yesterday too. It's not just let my people go. It's not into freedom, not in this abstract sense. They're going because... Israelites are the people that wrestle with God. That's what the word means. And let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness to find their proper place in the, in the structure of being, which is not under your tyranny. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loth to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. I have a a brief comment there. One of the things I learned from from reading the Jungian uh, thinkers was that, and Mircea Iliada was particularly powerful on this motif, was that you can't really distinguish the, the revenge of nature from the tyranny of the king. Because what happens when your state becomes corrupt and overbearing is that your ability to regulate nature deteriorates in a manner that's commensurate, and so nature rebels. So here's an example. With the, when the hurricane hit New Orleans, you could, say, well, that's, you could say, well, that's a natural disaster, right? It's an act of God. But then you could say, well, wait a second. The Dutch built their dikes to withstand one storm, the worst storm in 10,000 years. So when the storm hits the Netherlands, there's no natural disaster. Whereas the Army Corps of Engineers built the dikes to withstand one storm in a century. And so once every hundred years, there's a natural disaster. And then because the state that surrounds New Orleans is corrupt in many ways, not only is the infrastructure not built properly, but it's degenerated because of corruption. And so the rebellion of nature and the corrupt tyranny of the state are in some sense inseparable. And so it seems to me that that's part of the reason why here it's the very water that rebels is that if the state becomes tyrannical and corrupt enough, then everything is allowed to become polluted in some real sense. So, Well, I suppose the river and the, the, the Nile is as close as you can get to Egypt or the, the symbol of Egypt. It's, mm. the, the, it's the water of Egypt's life being right. turned well, to the, the waters of, sure. of, of death. Right. Um, it's like the water of life. Right. And, so, and now it's, it's yeah. become corrupted. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, it's turned to blood to remind them of the, the, the Hebrew babies that were drowned there. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, right. A bloody, so it's, it's a bloody river. Yeah. And d- isn't each, each of the plagues, 
is specifically targeting one of the Egyptian gods. Is yes. that right? Except so the, the Nile tenth, is, yeah. is, is, a, is the river god. Is a, there's right. a river mm-hmm. god of, of the Nile, yeah. Yeah. And and frogs. How did you find that out? I didn't know that at all. I just remember this vaguely from like, you know, freshman year of Jesuit high school. <laughs> from Jesuit high school. Those Jesuits, man. Well, one of the they things know what that, they're doing, the Jesuits. <laughs> one of the important aspects as well that we, we, we might miss is the use of the rod. That is, the use of the rod as a symbol of authority. This is a universal thing. Even like the Pharaoh the has as a scepter, the rod, mm-hmm. all of this as a manifestation of authority. Uh, and you see it in the, in the story as well. Well, it's there, the primordial tool, right? A stick. It's yeah. the primordial tool. And it, and, it, and it does represent that vertical mm. power, like the manner in which authority descends into the world is through this kind of vertical descent. Mm-hmm. So the rod represents that. You can imagine you know, striking the waters and then, and you'll see it's a Moses magic use, wand. use it. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. It is in, in many ways a magic wand. There are even images of early images of Christ where they show Christ's miracle where he's holding a staff. Mm. And he, he, he does his miracles with his staff because it's so ingrained in people's understanding. Well, why do you need a wand if you're a wizard? You just point out your hand and do your tricks. But no, you have to have a magic wand. And, so, and that's a derivative. It's of an the externalization staff of your authority. Mm-hmm. And that's what the miracle is also, is an externalization of authority. Yeah. And so the wand becomes a proxy for, it's like, I'm going to act. Right. And then the wand already is an externalization. Yeah. Well, you know, when, if you use a stick... Human nervous systems are extremely extendable. And so in some sense, like when you're in an automobile or in, or in an airplane, if you're flying it, then your body, your brain remaps the whole tool to be part of your body. And so we're tool using in the deepest possible sense. And it is definitely the case that the stick is the primordial tool. It's the first spear. It's the first, it's the first club. It's certainly a thing that you can smack snakes with, and I'm sure, you know, our tree-dwelling relatives caught on to that at some point in the extremely distant past. And so the notion that the rod is magic is the same as the notion that the tool is magic, and it's definitely magic. There's in any... Don't you move on to the Roman, what is it called, fasces? That are the rods of authority, and then you get fascism and right. authoritarianism. When those are when the rod can't turn into a snake anymore or, right. or maybe turns into too many snakes. It's always it. interesting to me how the icon carver's brain works because, you know, you need something. If God's moving through a person, it's like, well, how do you portray that? If you're making the action figure, what does he look like, right? And it's, there's this amazing conversation, not to get us too far derailed between Lucas, um, Kasdan and Spielberg when they were developing Indiana Jones. And the conversation you can find, and they're like, well, he needs a different kind of weapon. What's a weapon no one's had? Like, how about a whip, right? And we need him to have a hat, but the hat should have a personality, should have a life of its own. And so part of when we're trying to substantiate, when we're trying to make literal the symbolism, it can't just be that God, like if a wizard just points at somebody, well, what's a wizard look like? They need, we need props. We need, the Pharaoh has a, right? And so this is, of course, something that you are, dealing with in your depictions or else everyone would just look like a like a Ken doll, right? Everyone would look the same. Yeah, but and I so think modern need... fiction has actually been very good. Like something like fantasy, like Tolkien, the way they illustrate it, has been very good at, at making the costumes and the representation of the person as an extension of what they are so that you see it immediately. That's why Gandalf is such a yeah. striking figure with right. his staff and yeah. and uh, and 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 that he can he can thrust it into the ground with force and cause. Right, that's how I imagine Moses doing it, right? Right, right, right. Bang, exactly. Not yeah. like this. That's like Jonathan. Right, 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 that's what right, Jonathan exactly. carves too. He just shows up. I just like. <laughs> <laughs> Another question I'm trying to ask myself as I read this is, like, what's happened in my own life when I've hardened my own heart? And there's this very mm-hmm. powerful image here because the river, as James just pointed out, is that's, that's the kind of iconic. Thing about Egypt that the life is the, the Nile, source of life, yeah. the Nile, and 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 it just what's clearly what's going on here is that you know Pharaoh hardening his heart is in, into a disordered, you might say, in a wrong relation to to that to what really is. It turns even what is good and beautiful and life giving into a source of death, and it right. it does seem to me that 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 happens in our own lives. Yeah. You know when you, you know when you're out of when you're badly out of tune and willful. You know, things start to collapse and invert. Well, you start to die from the water, yes. from lack of the water of life. There's a famous Grimm's brother fairy tale that's called the water of life, and it's about a king who's old and anachronistic, and he's dying because he doesn't have the water of life, and that's associated mythologically with notions of the search for the Holy Grail, too, or the or the pool in the middle of the forest that revivifies, and 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 water is often used as a 
It's the antithesis of stone. It's the antidote to stone. It's the antithesis to thirst. You thirst in the desert where there's no water, obviously. And so there's a sense of what you're saying in which what Pharaoh's actually doing is he's already cutting himself off from the water in a profound sense. And this is a symbol of Yeah, and remember, of Moses is uh-huh. a master of water. I mean, fundamentally, right? He's, he's symbolized by water all the time, his relationship with yeah, water. Later on, he opens up the waters of life from the, from the rock, right, from the, which exactly. the people drink. As yeah. is in well, there's, well, that's exactly what he's doing with Egypt in yeah. some sense. He's, yeah. he's releasing the water of life from, from the rock that contains it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May I uh, just note what you mentioned about freedom you know, in verse 16? Uh, where it's let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. So this link between freedom and service, or even obedience, because the next line, it's thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So uh, you know, to, to use the distinction of Isaiah Berlin between negative and positive freedom, this is definitely positive freedom. I mean, this is not just freedom from the oppression of the Pharaoh. This is also uh, a, f- a life of freedom that is fulfilled in the sense that it is the realization of a particular role. The highest particular role. Du- exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what? true freedom is construed here as service to what is highest. It's not anarchic or chaotic. And the yes. negative with Berlin is basically the Janis Joplin definition, right? Like freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. It's when you just don't have anything. Mm-hmm. As opposed to, and it's interesting you said freedom's never used. Mm-hmm. That word's never it's used, concept, right? What's remarkable is Which is very interesting. Word. The same word for working as slaves is the word for serving the Lord and worship. Mm-hmm. It's the same word. Right, so the question then and the, becomes you know, the what distinguishes them. The skeptics have said them. the Lord is a despot, and they've shifted from one despot right. to another. Yeah. But those, you know, the Anglican prayer book, your service is perfect, perfect. freedom. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Incredible. From the wrong right. kind of worship to the right kind of worship. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, it's an unbelievably important part of that text, Douglas, so for bring, to, to reiterate that, because we, d- we don't ever want to confuse freedom with chaos. They're not the same thing. You know, if you're playing a chess game, you're free to do an almost infinite number of things on the chess game board, but you have to abide by the rules and you have to attempt to win in the proper manner. And, and so, and if if you, I used to play a game with my students in my class and I'd go up to someone when we were talking about such things and say, okay, do you want to play a game? Some random student, and they'd say yes. And I'd say, okay, you move first. And then they had no idea what to do. It's like, well, and I said, well, you could do anything you wanted. It's like, well, I'm lost. It's like, yeah, that's exactly. When you can do anything you want, you think that's freedom. It's, you that's better a, not ask the wrong student that. Yeah, I wouldn't ask you. <laughs> All right. We're and the magicians... Now, we're, we're now hitting what I consider the funniest verse in the Torah. All right. All right. All right. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. Okay. Why, do I, why is that so funny? Because there's no more water to turn into blood. Well, like, they're, doing, they're, they're doing the what? Moses did, what and they're, they're judging yes, too. Yes, they're saying they're to Pharaoh, in the hey, we can ruin our water supply too. <laughs> <laughs> I have always found this to be I'm hilarious. Yeah, no, does not doesn't Pharaoh go, what are you, morons? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. He ruins the water and you can do it too? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't they do the same later with the gnats or the yeah, flies? Yeah, he yeah, says just to add to it, yeah. The flies. Right. They can't yeah, do the flies. Yeah, right. right. that, that well, funny. they also say it's all the water in the land is right. already Turn so it's yeah. like what are they like they're they had, seeking yeah, out they, new they water had, to ruin? they had yeah. some some water apparently and the magicians of Egypt Egypt did so with their enchantments and Pharaoh's heart was hardened neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said Pharaoh turned and went into his house neither did he set his heart to this also and all the Egyptians digged round about the river for water to drink for they could not drink of the water of the river and seven days were fulfilled after that the Lord had smitten the river. Exodus 8. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. 
and the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Kids, and the magicians uh, kids, did... kids, kids, kids in Jewish life sing the following song. There were uh, one morning when Pharaoh woke in his bed, there were frogs on his head and frogs in his bed, frogs on his nose and frogs on his toes, frogs here, frogs there, frogs were jumping everywhere. Well, there, this is a and kind I'm of thinking, comical plague. Exactly. But, well, certainly. But the, the point that I love about that is the only reason these kids know about Pharaoh is because of the frogs. <laughs> the king, the demigod of Egypt is known to Jewish children Johnson, thousands of years you, later because of frogs. Do you think there's a, a transition here? So we have That's water great. first, but then frogs live halfway on water and halfway on land, right? Yeah. They're this mediating creature. And, you know, the, the, the tribe of native Canadians that I am associated with, they regard the frog as a weather vane of nature in some sense, too, because frogs are extremely sensitive to environmental degra degradation. Yeah. And so they're like, they're the amphibian equivalent of canaries in the coal mine. So, so what you'll see now in the, in the plagues is you're going to see something like this. You're going to see something like death coming from below and getting higher and higher. And so it starts with just the water, which is turned into blood. And now from the water come these frogs. And then later you'll see from the dust comes the lice and then the livestock. And then it's going to continue. We'll talk about it when we get there. So what you're seeing is basically the undoing of creation. You can understand it that way. That is creation is this union of heaven and earth. And now there's like a, there's, there's going to be an undoing where at first you're going to see the revolution of the earth from above. And then you're going to see a kind of oppression and hostility in aerial phenomena. Oz is. Okay, so Oz's point that was very interesting is that this great land of monuments were undone by gnats. Hmm. And also it's like, what's the, what's the animal most associated with the pharaoh, right, is a snake, right? And snakes eat frogs. And so like there's something that's very amusing with this, you know, Mel Brooks said, nothing can stand up to humor. That's why he made fun of Hitler, right? Mm -hmm. right. Nothing stands up to humor. And it's a very funny image to have this pharaoh with his grand, like, cobra yeah. decor yeah. being nothing. undone with frogs that a children's yeah. nursery can mock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's also, uh, it, it, there's the Egyptian god who's associated with frogs, which I think you should know of all mm. people. I have a little statue. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 Kek. Well, yeah, it's Kek. Yes. That's right. Kek. Yeah. And so it's yeah. another... That all came up with the whole peppy thing, too. Yeah, but, right. but the, the, so the Pepe thing is, is funny in this context, in the sense of the amphibian. For, for sure, the church father, St. Gregory of Nyssa, who I'm going to keep bringing up, sorry. So he really talks about the amphibious nature of the frogs as being important because it has to do with the undoing. So the undoing in that which has a hybrid identity, in that which oh, has right, right. an ambiguous identity. And so the frogs appear as, they really are monsters because they live both above and below. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they kind of set the image of the frogs become like an image of this undoing where identities are, are right. breaking down. Right, right, because they're, a, they're, a, they're, a, they're like a psychopomp in some sense. They inhabit both places. And it, the frogs are fine if there's not too many of them, but when the confused identity frogs are everywhere, then you have real trouble. Yeah, you're not supposed to have frogs in your house. They're in the water and in the, on, the, on, the, on the frog. But if <laughs> you have frogs in your house, frogs in your, bread. In your bread, yeah, that's, that's right. That's too many frogs. That's a lot of ambiguity, uh, yes. too much ambiguity. Important point to add, you're right about the anti-creation and the destruction, but only the Lord can restore, and he does every time. And it's the same thing with tyrants can destroy, and they do, but they can't rebuild. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's very clear from that. I like this theme of negative creation, that's kind of the unraveling of creation, Jonathan, decreation. And I think actually we're, we're licensed to 
get, take, draw that interpretation. If you look at, uh, is it verse 25? It's just the last verse. And seven days were fulfilled. After that, the Lord had smitten the river. So it's as if it, and that doesn't come elsewhere in any of the other plagues. So it's almost as if we're being invited to To understand think, it in relationship to the creation. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, and yeah. it is a very common mythological motif that when order falls apart, what you do see is a reversion to the potential that existed at the beginning of time. Those are the same thing, right? When order deteriorates, then you get a return, an undoing and a return to pre-cosmogonic chaos. And it's out of that that new order can emerge. Yeah. And you, can un- you also have to be careful. Even during the flood, we tend to think of the flood just as the water, but that's not what's going on. There's the water and the heavens, and it's the separation of the two which undoes the world. So we think of the flood just as the water, but you can think of the image of just water and just heaven and nothing alive in between. Mm-hmm. And so th- I think this is what we're going to see as we notice the first plagues are going like this, and then all of a sudden it moves up, and then everything goes crazy above. Mm-hmm. So is the construction of the tabernacle as a place where heaven and earth meet? Yeah. Then, yeah, that's what it okay. yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the tabernacle is the proper resting place of God. Right. And also, in some sense, that which shields God from the careless view of human beings, the too careless view of human beings. Yeah. And mm-hmm. the tabernacle mm-hmm. is an encap- is, is a encapsulation of creation. That's right. It's a microcosm of the world. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron did so, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Then it's just laughing. Yeah, same thing again. Yeah, it's like, here's some more frogs. We can do it too. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, I guess he's, he's, he, he's had it because he's up to his neck in frogs. It's like, entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses that they may remain in the river only? And he said, tomorrow. And he said, be it according to thy word, that thou may knowest that there are none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee and from thy houses back to order. Yeah. And from thy servants. So as soon as the tyrant bows to the will of God, then the ambivalent monsters depart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And from thy people, they shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh And Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. That's another place, Stephen, where you can think about how that works in your own life. It's like, you repent, you get away with it, you think, ha, I got away with it, I can do it again. It's like, and the Lord said unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And so then they're longing for the days of frogs. And they did so. the third plague of each set of three, forgetting the 10th is totally separate, they don't warn Pharaoh. Ah, ah. Just the, just the pattern that it, that it, that Well, it, the first that it one's is. in the morning bathe, isn't That's it? Also a, and also the second a pattern. one comes That's right. from the palace. Mm-hmm. Third one, there, no there, one. There are a lot of patterns in the plagues. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very carefully constructed. Mm-hmm. I wonder why it's the third time there's no warning. Well, I guess you've been warned twice. Mm-hmm. Right, you're warned, you're warned twice. twice. That's and then fair, we'll right? Then, I warned then, you twice. Right, exactly. Yeah, and then we'll start it over again. It's what's established to create a pattern that one can anticipate, right? You need, that's how jokes work, mm. right? You need the first two and you anticipate the pattern, then you subvert it. Mm. So mm. It's, it's, in some ways, it's giving the Pharaoh fair chance right. with two. Right. Right. right, but it also, oh, but it also adds an, an anomalous twist to the new threat because it's not predictable. Because now you think, well, I, I'm going to be warned about this. It's like, no. You yeah, two chances. Into a face, yeah. false sense of security. But there's another point in what you read, and that is the educational purpose of the plagues. In other words, they're obviously a question of power. 
And there are obviously a question of judgment, as you were saying about the river of blood. But, you know, that you may know that there's no one like the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the whole ten is to show Pharaoh he's not God. Right. Definitely. Right. You know, that and, comes and very strongly. And part of the point there, too, is demonstrative. that Pharaoh is such a tyrant that it takes ten plagues before to he... To get to him. Yeah. It's yeah. to show the Israelites, too. Oh, forgive me. I, yeah. just, just, it's a very big uh, theme here. The... the uh, and it's written in, I don't like to read into text, it's written in that that it will be known that I am I am God by, I have defeated all the gods of Egypt, but it is as much a message to the Israelites as it is to Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's saying that, that Pharaoh, not just that uh, Pharaoh is, is no longer, is, is not, not God, but also that he's no, no longer Pharaoh that he's no longer king over Egypt, that God has total control over all of the gods of Egypt and everything that gives Egypt life that makes it tick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's, an, it's continually emphasizing the principle of reality itself, right? Is that even if you're tyrannical and even if you have all the power there is, if you violate the heavenly order, yeah. everything will go to hell. Yeah, and the God of Genesis, that's right. God, it's the God of Genesis, as it were, re-revealing himself, but in more in negative terms, as it were. That's, yeah, that's, that's having exactly, total that's control exactly. over, na over the natural order and, and transcending it completely. And Israel, right from, that's Jacob's name, right, is Israel, yeah. um, meaning those who struggle with God. What's interesting is it's not a tyrannical rule despite the power. You're allowed to struggle. You're allowed, if you're Moses, you're allowed you to say- And you have free will too. Well, Moses goes back and forth with God a lot as we've been observing. There's a lot of there's a lot of movement and negotiation with their faith to come to understand God, to come to understand their role, to not want to heed the calling. There's room that's built in that isn't evidenced in right. the Pharaoh. So that's the qualitative distinction in some sense between servitude in Egypt and the servitude of God in the wilderness is that although they're, it's both subordination in some sense to a structure of power, the the, the manner in which the, the power manifests itself is right. completely different. And what and happens it, when you negotiate with Pharaoh? He says, no, now get, get your own straw to make right, it break. Right, right. He just, makes, he just doubles way. down. Right. right, whereas God's pretty patient with Moses. He's like, all right, we'll give you Aaron. Like, mm -hmm. I'll explain, I'll be there. Right, and That's he wants, fine. well, the other thing too is that God wants voluntary assent. Mm -hmm. Right, which is right. the opposite of the tyrant. Which is the but struggling. The complete opposite of the right. tyrant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the Jewish notion of argument on behalf of heaven. And it's a great notion. You can argue with the Lord, Abraham at Sodom or Job. Mm -hmm. You can argue Bargain. with the Lord if you're arguing on behalf of his creation. Mm -hmm. That's a magnificent tradition, I think. Yes, we, we learned that early on. That's right. By the way, it's a, in, in light, I feel silly commenting on my own comment, but in, in, in light of, of this notion that this will make an impression on the on Israel as well as on Egypt. I've, I've smitten all their gods and the Pharaoh. Uh, the, one of the great lessons, in my opinion, is that miracles don't work. People, people think, I know this from decades of talking to people on the radio and in speeches that, uh, oh, if only God did X, Y, or Z, mm -hmm. as Woody believe. Allen said, if he just sneeze, <laughs> I, I would be. I would believe in him, mm -hmm. but it's not true. No, no miracles not. do not produce faith. No, it's one of the most important things for everyone, every modern person to know. There are many reasons to believe in God, but a miracle won't change your mind. And and if, like many of us, you believe that all of life is a miracle, our, our talking here, the, the birth of, of the birth, not just of a human child, the birth of an ant, if you don't see that as a miracle, then why will you see split seas as a miracle? Well, and Moses is obviously capable of seeing a miracle because he turns to look at the burning bush. That's right. It's, that's right. That, that's why that was an important part. That's right. Well, yeah, well said. Yes. And there's knock-on effects both ways, right? I mean, in Moses's case, the let's say the incipient moral principle of slaying the Egyptian, even if he's kind of cowardly about it, to having the sensitivity of heart to turn away to see the bush, which then the burning bushes then leads to the encounter with God that then leads so too with Pharaoh. You know, he hardens his heart the first time, he hardens the second time. And I think this happens in our own lives. Like, it's not just the things you've been warned about that, that 
that your hardness of heart causes you trouble on, but they have knock-on effects too. And so then you do this wrong and then, oh gosh, and then that too. And so I think that it was this third thing of not being warned. It's this That's sense right. that That's you get right. into the train of this. It's like, no, 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 no. It's way worse than you right, think. Right, right. You've already st- set yeah. something in motion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's also, there's also a gospel story that I can't bring to mind right now where Christ says to there's a servant who's been warned not to misbehave and knows not to and misbehaves anyways. And there's another servant who does the same thing, but in ignorance. And Christ says to him that because you knew, your punishment is going to be much harsher. And so this is, you've been warned twice and you didn't listen. And so now something else is going to happen to you. And that's deserved because you were in fact warned and you didn't listen. And I saw this in my clinical practice very, very frequently that you know, my clients would be ignorant about something and be punished for it. But then when they woke up and realized what they were doing and still did it, the punishment was redoubled. Mm. So that's yeah. like in Catholic, Catholic absolution, right? In confession, you're not allowed to sin with the notion you can absolve yourself of it later. Mm-hmm. Right. You can't premeditatedly sin and know you have an out. Right. That's not an escape. No. Mm-hmm. In fact, you, that's, that's worse. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is jumping ahead a bit, but he, he does, there's, I think, a difference between Pharaoh recognizing that he's, you know, that the, the, the God of the Hebrews is, is against him and then wanting to try and remedy that. And then genuine, a genuine show of penitence later on. I think this is just before, I think it's just before the, the, the killing of the firstborn where he actually repents. He says he expresses sorrow. Um, and it's almost as if the, the, the you know, that 10th plague, which is just you know, the, probably the, the most horrific of them all, is a sort of, is, is, is such a serious punishment because his sorrow, his, his, his awareness, his conscience is really awakened at that point. I mean, it's beginning to be here, but it's still quite instrumental. He realizes something wrong, something's wrong well, and he, he knows that he, he can fix it. It may also be that by the 9th plague, it's just too late, right? Even if you do repent at that point, it's like, yeah, but still the process has been set in motion. And so, and that's what did Nietzsche say? You might think you're done with the past, but that doesn't mean the past mm-hmm. thinks it's done with you. And that's like- By yeah, the way, you've so. made me rethink Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. I just wanted you to know, I, uh, he had a lot of profound uh, things to say. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's. He's something. He got a, I assume he has such a bad too. name because the, the, the Nazis liked him. I mean, why does yeah, he well, have such sister, a bad name? His sister warped a lot of his writing, and, and then there were derivatives of it that were used by the Nazis to justify their actions. But Nietzsche's philosophy is he, he had an absolute horror of absolutist states, mm-hmm. and that's crystal clear. And so, no, and the consequences definite, of the death of God. Oh, yes. And he, there's no everything. one more prophetic about that except right. maybe Dostoevsky. And he no. always spoke very highly of you, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I didn't want to say. I didn't want to say. I, uh... And but and could I, they did. Could so. I, before yes, you please, go and pick please. up Dennis's point, I agree with you totally. And, and Jesus makes roughly the same point. You know, when in the parable, someone says, "You know, send someone down to my relatives," and he says, "No, even if they see a resurrection from the dead, they won't believe." Right. So you're absolutely right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. What you have here, you have words, and there's a lot of words, but words are vital, but not enough. And then you have these power wonders, and the two together, and, and they're not enough, and eventually it has to be the tenth one that does it. But I wanted to raise the question for all of us at the end, maybe, what are the lessons for this, for our confronting what's today a system and a spirit that is all embracing? In other words, so often we are just words. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And clearly words alone for Moses, not enough. Mm-hmm. Or for the Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. No, well, and, I mean. and there's a negative miracle aspect here too. It might be that people are less convinced about positive miracles, but if something negative enough happens to you, you know, that's outside your realm of expectation, sometimes that can actually wake you up. You have uh, an example? Just um, Death. Eatson? Death or... or uh, or a catastrophe in your life. Oh, or oh, oh I see. Oh, that's it. But, but the people see that as a miracle, though. Well, 
The uh, that's a good uh, question. You know, uh-huh. uh, we tend to think of a miracle as only as something only positive. positive, but oh, these plagues are obviously miracles. That's right. I like right. that. That's so, fascinating. And, and, and it's a lot more difficult negative to deny a negative miracles. miracle. Yeah. Tra- I've never yeah. thought of that. Am I happy I came? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's nothing happier than a negative miracle, man. I always think about I think about Solzhenitsyn in that regard of like where where he was to have his epiphany. Right. right? He was like the least empowered human being. I mean, he had, what, testicular cancer in a gulag. Like, there was, yeah, you can't, weeks. yeah, I mean, and that's where he had an awakening. Yeah. Frank, about too. Mandela, right? I think the negative miracle problem, I'm really, you've, you've really tr- transfixed me here. The, I th- it re- leads to a different issue for me. God's existence to me is so rationally compelling that I, I, don't, I don't even understand atheism. But I think God's goodness is a leap of faith, not God's right, existence. Right, right. But I think it's the leap of faith because, it in some sense, what faith. you do is you decide that things are good and you're going to act in the service of the good in many ways, despite the evidence. <laughs> yes. Right. right. So that's why it's an act of faith. It's like, well, yeah, you know, you can it's, you can understand arguments for nihilism and despair, especially if you meet people who've been brutalized beyond belief. But then now and then you meet someone who's been brutalized beyond belief. And instead of being corrupt and nihilistic, they've pulled out of that a goodness that's so deep that it's it's miraculous. And you meet people like that pretty damn often. And so, and they've decided, and really they've decided despite all this, and it's sometimes that's so brutal, you can't even listen to it. It's despite all this, I do believe that things are good, and I will serve the good, but, and that's faith. But that's, that, yes, but they're they're not in those cases. They're rarely doing so without their own evidence. I mean, they're 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 precisely the people who are able to, to to illuminate to you, you know, the the abiding underlying goodness because they're actually connected with it. It's not yeah, not well, doing I, this in a pe- vacuum. People usually well, it's maybe associated with the burning bush idea. I mean, I'm thinking of an artist that I've worked with for a long time who was brutalized beyond belief when he was young. And he, he found his salvation through beauty. And so it was like the burning bush. He noticed that despite how catastrophic his life had been and how tyrannized he was in the most fundamental sense, beauty beckoned to him and he, and he, and he heeded the call and it completely transformed his life and his, his character, his career, everything. Right, so it's not as if it's simply against the evidence. I mean, there is, right, that is right. to say, well, there but, is, but, yes. but he, Right, right, but he was, he was, yeah, that's so interesting, too, because he was still, despite all that, he was still open to the possibility that, that there might be something b- beyond the catastrophe, right? But isn't part of the answer what we were saying yesterday in the nature of God? You don't come to discover him abstractly. He's, I will be who I will be in my actions, delivering you, caring for you. You come to know. He's good. There is evidence, as Stephen is saying. Sure, isn't that the answer, De- Dennis, to what you're saying? We don't say he's good because it's theology principle number 15 or whatever. But because, but because, finish. Because we've seen the goodness of God in his actions in history or in our own individual lives or whatever. Well, it, it, it would seem to be a hard argument to make to a concentration camp survivor, mm-hmm. that the that he has seen predominantly the goodness of God. Mm-hmm. However, having said that, there is an interesting book written long ago about the theology of concentration camp survivors. Mm-hmm. And it found that, and I, I, don't, I don't claim that this is absolutely correct, but I'm just telling you what it reported, and it seemed to me to make sense, that the percentage of Jews who went through the death camps, and I specifically mentioned death camps, who came out, the proportions of atheists and believers was the same. Many switched. Atheists became believers and believers became, but the proportion remained virtually identical. So there is, and there are people who have only good in their life, relatively speaking, who don't believe in God. So I'm challenging my own 
question, because I've wrestled with this, because I, I think the, the hardest law in the 613 laws of the Torah is to love God with all your heart and all yeah. your soul. Yeah. I, I, I long believe that's the hardest. I have no problem trying yeah. to well, obey to God. throw yourself into existence fully as if it's good. Yes. And that's a as, rough one, because, that, geez, right. look at it. It's that's pretty right. rough. That's man. right. That's right. So Solzhenitsyn was struck in the concentration camps by goodness, though, constantly. And it was out of that seed of the observation of goodness mm, that the whole Gulag <laughs> archipelago emerged, and therefore, in some no, in no small part, the, the fall way, of the Soviet that's Union. That's a prophet. Solzhenitsyn is a prophet. Yeah, and he said, well, he said that he, view, he, he really noticed particularly, and he was atheistic when he went into the camps, that the, the devout religious believers were able to maintain their moral integrity in camp. And, and physical. Often, yes. Yeah. Not always, because he said, no, like, let's not push this. Sometimes people just got shot. Yeah. But he saw people, and he tells very compelling stories of people who thrived and became healthier in the face of the privation under the ultimate moral authority of their own shining soul. And the stories in the Gulag, especially in volume two, are, they're unbelievably compelling. And Frankel said similar things. And Solzhenitsyn was particularly careful not to say, that doesn't mean I'm saying that everyone who failed failed because of their moral flaws or that purity of heart would necessarily save you. you know, he's a complex thinker, but... That's but, one of the miracles I think he saw when I was talking about him earlier, because... He it was you know he he talked about how some people were hardy and and robust yeah. and he was careful to say it's not like you can secret your way to health in a gulag right he wasn't being flippant about mm -hmm. it but he was noticing that some people who had and they wouldn't more resources they wouldn't cooperate with right the, with the but they gulag were broken yeah they were never become trustees and they tell the it was cool yeah. hand Luke you yeah. Know? yeah 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 it's yeah, also yeah. the epistemic humi hum the epistemic humility though the difference between the presumption that you know all there is and it's bad, and you're saying, I don't have it all. I mean, you think those last words that Job says at the very end of, 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 of the book of Job, therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful me, which I knew not. Right, That, right, that yeah. at the end of it all saying, I didn't actually understand the whole picture. Well, it's also hope in that, you know, because yes. one of the things is that if you're suffering terribly, there's two options in front of you in some sense. One is you're suffering terribly and it's unjust and you're suffering terribly because the cosmos itself is flawed in its fundamental structure. And that's really Cain's complaint against God. The other possibility is you're suffering at least in part because you're not everything you could be. And that's a terrible burden to take onto yourself because it's a burden of your own suffering. But it's also unbelievably hopeful because it could be that I think maybe Frankel recounts that story. I don't remember where I read it. A woman who, who visited a psychiatrist and who said to the psychiatrist, I really hope there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And the psychiatrist said, why? She said, well, if there's something wrong with me, there's hope because I might be able to fix it. But if there's something wrong with the structure of existence, so I'm fated to suffer in this way, then I, everything's despair. And the people that I have seen who've transcended their tragedy and malevolence that have pursued them, they did have that, that sense of their own ignorance, even with regards to the conclusions they drew about their suffering. Yes. And, so, and Frankl himself has this very odd story at the end of the book, where after this, this array of unspeakable horrors, he then talks about this particularly sadistic, brutal figure, um, whom he'd known from some clinic, the Stein, whatever, in, in Vienna or something. And then he says that he heard a story that this man, this concentration camp figure, had been sent off to a Russian camp at the end of the war, and then heard from another colleague that this brutal figure um, had actually been extremely humane and supportive as an inmate of a Soviet camp. Mm -hmm. And and it's that very enigmatic mm -hmm. ending of Frenkel's book where it's almost as if to say, even where you're convinced that there's evil that's irredeemable, right, right, right. that maybe there's, there's, there's a possibility. Still there's, there's still, still yes, yes. hope for redemption. Yeah, I, I know that's yeah. a bit, it seems like a bit, but it, it, no, it is, no, no, he, no, he, no, it's, it's a, very possible. Why do you think that, it's, why is that idea considered so dangerous? What idea? This idea that 
Because, you know, even when Because we want it to be... Well, we want it to it be... It immediately goes into blaming the victim. Like, even you even went to pains to say he wasn't saying that anybody could, right, through the inner light of their soul, come out positively in a gulag. But there's such a resistance against this notion. It's like it's almost outside the Overton window to say you can alleviate some of your own suffering by your orientation towards the world. It's almost considered a dangerous proposition now. And, and we have to go to pains to make caveats about it when we even mention it. Yeah, well, it's a tricky business. When my daughter was young and she was really ill, I told her when she was very young, I said to her, don't you use your illness as an excuse ever because you'll confuse yourself. Then you won't know what you can do. You're going to have a hard time doing things. But if you use your illness as an excuse, if you corrupt yourself morally, which you have, in some sense, every right to do because of the depth of your suffering, and which would be perfectly understandable under the circumstances, it will do nothing at all but make the situation far worse. Yeah, it's true so, that the, 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 dis the, the boundary between sin and syndrome has got more and more blurred. Uh, the idea that you know moral, moral failure can, can become so easily pathologized, and, and in pathologizing it, we, we risk fixing it. It becomes a sort of part of who we are, as opposed to something that we can be redeemed from, that we can we can confess and repent from. We also we and also moves to possession. Jonathan and I were discussing this a little bit with this you know mental health pandemic that we're seeing all around us, but particularly in teenagers, where it's you have depression, you have anxiety, rather than you're in a healing crisis, right? There's a beginning, a middle, and end. It doesn't mean you won't have another one and another yeah. one, but you're at least oriented in some ritualistic meaning right. to integrate it gives into you some agency. The illness isn't an ingredient in your identity. It's, yeah. it's something right. that you can, in yeah. principle. Yeah, and you're going to blow out at your weak points always. You know, it, it could happen again and again. Life is a series of hero quests and healing crises. But we tend to, to talk about, we, we must remove this, right? Well, when, you can degenerate, I suppose, into what happens to Job is he gets, he's cursed by God in some real sense or by Satan at least, and then he's sick to death and scraping his wounds with pot shards by the fire, and then his friends come along and say, well, you know, obviously you did something to deserve this, which is often the case for sick people, right? It's not only are they sick, but everybody thinks, well, if you would have just behaved better, it's like, <laughs> and so that's part of the problem, right? Is that, is that, and I guess that's why it's so important to so carefully separate the wheat from the chaff. It's like, well, we, we found this a lot when dealing with my daughter when she was so sick, because for example, if she wouldn't get out of bed in the morning, it's like, well, what do you do about that? Do you attribute to the illness? Do you blame it to the illness? Do you let her off the hook? And the answer is, you pay as much attention as you possibly can. So she moves ahead as much as she can, but no more. And, and that judgment is so, it's so difficult to make, especially with someone who's ill. And maybe that's part of our scattered attention and focus right now, right? I mean, if everything moved from, you know, texts to blogs to posts to tweets to Instagram, right? Like our attention is so focused that maybe that's part of the process, part of the process of collapsing the space you said between sin and syndrome, because it requires, it's not that complicated in some ways you know, to have that sort of conversation with somebody. Like right, the conversation but it has you to be personal, right? Well, and, and you have to really slow down and take time yeah, in the morning to yeah. say, okay, what's going on? Can right. you really Sinner not get out of syndrome. bed? Yeah, exactly. Right, like, exactly. okay, you can't get out of bed. Great, we'll try tomorrow. Or, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a very delicate mm -hmm. proposition because you're dealing with people's vulnerabilities. And if you get it wrong... Well, and you also have to help them test it. So I remember one time we were, she had... We were going to buy her a scooter so she could get around. And so she had to go and take motorcycle lessons. And somebody crashed the motorcycle a bit at one of the lessons. And she woke up in the morning and she was afraid to go. And no wonder, she just had a hip replacement. So she, and so she was on like a motorbike three weeks later. And so it was risky, but we thought, man, this kid's got to be able to move around. And she was afraid to go. And so her mother said to her, why don't you just get out of bed and come with me in the car? And then when you get there, you can see if, if you can do this or not, and maybe you can't. And then, well, when she got there, and so that was that judicious pushing, is it sin or syndrome? Well, it's no wonder you're afraid. And so we think we're crazy in some sense, like you just had your hip replaced, now we're putting you on a motorbike, that's a big risk. Maybe it's wrong, maybe you're right to be afraid. 
And so then you test it, right? That's collaborative empiricism. That's what the behaviorists call it. It's like, well, maybe this is the right way forward. Why don't we go out and test it a little bit? And well, and see? it takes an incredible amount of empathy without falling into complete empathy. Mm -hmm. Right, because That's you right. have to be aware if someone says, no, I have different limitations than you, dad, right? Yeah. I, I actually can't do that, and maybe you could now or when you were my age, but it's being incredibly attuned to the differences without falling into the ease of a of 100% empathy solves all problems. But, but also, there's no, I think we need to be careful to, not to confuse these things. There's, there's no, there's no, there's no um, uh, we don't have to deny that there are victims and injustices or anything else to say that it's always good to be open to what you don't understand or what is beyond you or, or to, right, to, right. to be open to the burning well, bush in well, your own life. So especially then. They're not, they don't have to be in any way confused. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it's an absolute, yeah. no matter what you're going through, that, you that, know, that rigidity there's more than you see. And rigidity is the enemy, always. Mm -hmm. But that's especially the case with God, that, that we're so tempted to think in anthropomorphic terms about God as a moral agent, that it's to say as a member of our moral community, and mm -hmm. to evaluate him as, as if we would evaluate the uh, Pharaoh. Uh, I think that's why, you know, Stephen citing the, quoting the last verse of Job, is, uh, that's a, a, a brilliant observation, I think, mm -hmm. that, that God is the source of all goodness in the classical theistic tradition. He's identical with goodness. Well, uh, then, well, he's that in virtue of which any good action is a good action. Well, it also means that if the victim is only construing himself or herself as a victim and everyone else is doing that, you're also in some sense saying to them that there is no pathway forward That's right. through this, right? Yeah. There is no possibility of the miraculous revelation. And, and that the miraculous revelation might not even be a cure. It might be that if you could see what's beckoning properly, at least while you're dying, you'd have this love and support around you that you need, so that isn't utter hell, right? Well, it's also the shame motif we're talking about. Moses hid his face, it's Adam and Eve, because if you can get to the place that you're not a hapless victim in the face of the injustices of the universe, objectively, and there is a part that has to do with you, right. that's gonna produce shame, and you have to be strong enough to get through shame to see and confront the burning bush and be transformational. It's it's such a, it, I was struck so much in reading Exodus how much how much of that is a, is a recurring motif. Mm. I just want to add the um, when I explain to people the difference fundamental difference between a religious education Jewish or Christian and a secular education in our time, I say it this way: I was raised the biggest problem in Dennis Prager's life is Dennis Prager. Right in secular schools. In our time, the greatest problem in your life is America, racism, sexism, homophobia, your parents, never you, always something outside of you. Mm -hmm. And that dichotomy- you know, It destroys your agency. It, totally. It, it, totally. Well, it, it, and that's it, the point in, in and, some and real sense. It, it's an incredible thing because it destroys you and the society. Right, right. It's disempowering. To coin a to, to right. Yeah. right. Yeah, 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 right. To coin right. All right, so, and the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So their lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water. So we're in the next cycle, right? The beginning of the next cycle. And say unto him, thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee and upon thy servants and upon thy people and into thy houses. It's another humiliation, real humiliation there of the Pharaoh. And the houses of Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground whereon they are. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou may knowest that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses and into all of the land of Egypt, the land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, 
it is not meet, it is not right, so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three journeys into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. Now the abomination of the Egyptians, if I remember correctly, Egyptians held cows as sacred. It's something like that. The, the Hebrews were going to sacrifice something that the Egyptians re, would regard as appalling to sacrifice, right? As sacred, mm -hmm. exactly. And so Moses basically objects when the Pharaoh says, well, you can do it here in Egypt. Moses says, no, we can't do it because the Egyptians will be very upset with us. We have to go away from them to do this. So that's what that abomination of the Egyptians means. Um, the Paschal sacrifice is a god of Egypt. Right. Okay, okay, so that's really the crucial yeah. issue there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so they're sacrificing the God of the Egyptians. It's no wonder the Egyptians are upset about that. Yeah. So, and Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away for obvious reasons. Entreat for me. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did, according to the word of Moses. And he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let the people go. Great, we're cruising today. Exodus 9, anything to say about the flies specifically? It's, it's part well, of this I, transition? Yeah, so I, I think you'll see, so it's, it's moving up, right? So you have got the frogs, this ambiguous, and you've got the lice, and you've got the flies, and then the next plague, you're going to see a transition, which actually is kind of, a, it's actually an anti, uh, an anti burning bush, by the way, where, well, we'll read it, and then we can talk about it later. Okay. That's, that's okay. that. Okay, so we're moving up the heavenly hierarchy in some sense. That's right, from, but from, like a weird upside down, like a breaking apart of the, of the, of creation through this. It's also interesting, though, the way these, this, this, it's just a, you know, in a way, it's just a fly, right? There's a lot of them. But, but it's quantity the, the, too. But there's something. There's mm -hmm. something about right. the, the. So there's something. The quantity has to do with the earth. That's what the earth is, right? So you have quality above, and you have quantity below. And so when quantity invades, right? When think about it like you have a. You could think about it like you have a, 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 a nation, and then you have the swarms of barbarians that come in, and the quantity just overruns the quality. Right? There's always more outside than there is so inside. So is that the multiplicity that's overriding right. them, the unity? That's what it is. And that's why it's multiple. It's like it's, you know, it's, you're drowning in frogs, you're drowning in lice, you've got swarms of flies. It's, it's, it's quantity that is overtaking the identity of the Egyptian. And it's a small thing, right? I mean, it's a lot of these it's little things, you know, things. our sins are like that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> little, a lot of the little ones that adds up. But I just want to quickly draw attention to verse 28, where I'll let you go that you may sacrifice the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far mm -hmm. in treat for me. And there's this whole sense that you were talking a lot, Jonathan, about the instrumentally, instrumentalization of the, of the Hebrews. And there's a sense like, well, okay, I'll let you sort of pay attention to the transcendent, but only on my terms. So there's, it's this, it's this sense of, of he's refusing to relinquish, even the relinquish is on terms that are not relinquishing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's a, there's a, there's a, there's a profound sense in which well, he's, he's, also he's not, to... he's absolutely not bowing right. to the principle, even when he says he is, he's like, well, not really. Yeah, yeah. When we talk about this, this kind of divine balance, it's interesting, Jordan and I talk a lot about the, the big five personality traits as they equate to political orientation, right? High trade openness, right? Tends to be more liberal, right? And it's very interesting because when either one is unchecked, Right. If it's, if it's conservatism unchecked tends to go to tyranny that's specific and encompassed in one person. Liberalism unchecked turns into a swarm that like, it's like death by a thousand paper cuts. And it's a very interesting. Well, it is definitely the danger of openness. That's right. right? Because openness. Let more in. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. the, and the, and the difficulty and the of, of multiplicity and contamination. And the diff, yeah, right. And the pro, right. And in group favoritism. Right. But the difficulty of, of let's call it tyrannical closedness. Right. Taken to the wrong extreme is new ideas and people don't get in. In and you yeah. stagnate well, that's also and the, ossify that's and That's also die. the kingdom of stone. Yes. Because everything's set in stone. And, and so, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, okay. Exodus 9. 
Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go, and wilt hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in thy field, upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep, there shall be a very grievous moraine. And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And that, that motif is established in this second cycle of plagues. So now it's just the Egyptians that are, that are clearly that are suffering from this. And so the, the Lord is marking off his people as immune from the, from the coming plagues. And there shall nothing die of all that is the children's of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow. And all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. And Pharaoh sent. And behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. Now you had some. You so had this is this is the transition. That. Like there's yeah. a tr there, now as you really see this transition up into heaven, and it happens in a very strange way, which is almost like an anti-burning bush, which is he's taking soot. Soot is the remainder. It's the residue, right? It's the lowest thing. It's the remainder of a of a burning process, and so he he takes it and he he brings it up into the heaven. And then from this moment, you'll see something. All the 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 the, the following plagues will have to do with. Wind, you'll see the wind that blows the locust and then the darkness in the sky, the hail and the fire that comes from above. Uh, and so it's, but it's very interesting because it's almost like taking the remainder, taking the residue and lifting it up as a, as a kind of principle. It's, it's a very uh, it's strange. It's amphibious. Behavior. It's the role that the frogs played out of water onto land, right. out of land into heaven. So it's, yeah. And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt. So it's blowing around and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Yeah, these are getting pretty serious, these plagues. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man. It's like the bubonic plague, and upon beast. By the way, uh, a lot of people raise the question, why are all the Egyptians suffering? And so that raises the f huge issue of, is there such a thing as collective guilt? Well, it seems there, there doesn't have to be, Dennis. I don't, I don't believe that. One of the things I really learned from Solzhenitsyn in particular, and Rod Dreher has just written about this as well, it's like, you can think of the totalitarian state as the people laboring under the burden of Pharaoh. That's sort of the top-down crimes of obedience theory, right? It's authoritarian leaders, the people are basically innocent, and they, they work for the tyrant under compulsion. Or you can think, and I was just in Albania talking to people about this, and I went to the museum of the House of Leaves, which was the central museum for their KGB equivalent, and they spied on everyone. And all the Albanians I talked to, left and right, they all said the same thing. Under the Soviets, everyone lied about everything to everyone all the time. And so the tyranny is distributed through oh, the entire uh, system. That was my point, actually. Yeah. So uh, I, I say the Torah does believe in collective guilt, and and by the way, there's a there's a verse which I didn't comment on earlier, where it, it says, and and Pharaoh spoke to all his people, all the people participated in the killing of of the of the Jewish children of the Hebrew children. Uh, so I, I I totally agree with what you said. Clearly, there are individuals who resist, right. but, but uh, that well, is they, rare. They're spared sometimes. I mean, you get that story with with uh, with Sodom and Gomorrah. You don't need that many good individuals right, for right, it to be but, spared. Yeah. But I don't think it's the thing. Is I think it's important. It's not collective guilt. It's that everybody in a community has the guilt, but it's because they did Fair something enough. wrong. They're they're lying. That's and, right. And, yes. Yes. And, and if they right. so Solzhenitsyn said famously, you know. One man who stops lying can bring down a tyranny. And 
Well, and we've seen examples of that. I would say Gandhi did that to some degree. Martin Luther King did that to some degree. Solzhenitsyn certainly did that to a great and remarkable degree. And so these things clearly happen. And one word of truth will outweigh the whole world. It's like, well, how can it that's, not? Because the truth is immutable and final. You have to final. censor truth. Mm -hmm. But it's also the case that an unjust ruler can cause enormous destruction to innocent people. So, I mean, I don't think we have to conclude that they're all But it, he can't do it alone. alone. Uh, right. The, an well, unjust well, well, ruler well, well, alone... Wait, but you, his point is right. I mean... There, there can still be innocent right. victims also, within the collective, right. which is why it shouldn't be I, collective. I don't believe yeah. there would have been a Holocaust without Hitler. I believe many Germans are guilty, not all, but many, but I, I do believe that Hitler made the Holocaust possible. I think they would have called forth another Hitler. With, reg with regard to a Holocaust or with regard to World War II? They're not the same things. It wouldn't have been the same Holocaust, right? I mean, they, so one of the things I really learned from Jung, because he studied Hitler in great detail and what he accomplished, let's say. So Hitler was a very powerful orator, but he was also a very powerful listener. And Hitler was resentful for a variety of reasons, and he was also obsessed with order and disgust. He's a very strange person, so he had his particular idiosyncrasies that made the Holocaust what it was. But then when he spoke to people, he was like a comedian in the negative sense. So I, I think I guys told you guys this story the other day. Jimmy Carr, when, the comedian, before he goes out on his world tours, he goes and does 50 shows and he tries out his new material and all comedians do this. And he tells jokes and some people, some jokes no one laughs at, so he gets rid of those. But the jokes that people laugh at, he keeps. Mm -hmm. And so Hitler spoke spontaneously and he watched the crowds. And every time the crowd went roar, he'd think, yes, one. And then the crowd would roar about something else, he'd think, two. And soon everything he said made the crowd roar. And the crowd is a conscienceless mob. And so the, the conscious, conscienceless mob called out the devil in Hitler. Why? Well, the Germans were angry. Well, why? Well, World War I, there were brutalized men everywhere, the Versailles Treaty, the absolute collapse of the economy, their wounded pride. They had reasons to be bitter and nihilistic. And so there was a deep longing for a target, a target, a, a reason, an external reason. It was the Jews, it was the gypsies, it was the people who are different. They're responsible for this. And so, and Hitler could, he could, he gave voice to that. He gave voice and emotion to that. And so maybe without Hitler, it wouldn't have happened, but maybe another populist would have come along and done something equivalent, you know, in a slightly different direction. Didn't Jung also make the point that it was only possible in Germany because Germany was the, the, the most evolved, I'm using the term mm -hmm. not literally. Efficient. Well, they were the furthest away from their uh, archetypal roots, right? It was the most philosophers, it was the most conductors, yeah. right? Only at the peak of civilization can you be so far removed from the shadow mm -hmm. that the shadow can overtake you. Mm -hmm. Well, he certainly <laughs> believed, Jung believed that part of what drove the Nazi spirit forward was the re-sacralization of the political. You know, so Germany had collapsed into a godless materialist atheism in some real sense. And so that brought forth a deep longing for the archetypal gods and Hitler provided that. Orwell knew that. I mean, when Orwell started to warn about the Nazis, one of the things he warned about, he was so courageous. He said, you underestimate these people. They've harnessed these primordial forces of spectacle and blood and fire and beauty. They've rekindled the ancient gods. And Jung thought it was Odin on the warpath again in some fundamental sense. And so the, the reason Germany was prone to that, I suppose, is because they were the farthest along the technocratic, materialist, atheist path. And that set up this longing for a return to the in some real sense to the pagan gods. Well, you know, those who were those who um who don't remember history are doomed to be possessed by to it again. Right, mm -hmm. right. And well, in some ways, Nazis, it's like the Nazis knew this. It's not like they didn't play with pagan imagery constantly. Mm, right. The iconography right. is very clear. But it doesn't yeah. work if you're close to, to to real pagan industry if it's still interwoven in your life. If you still have, you know, your 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 roots go all the way down into archetypes and ritual. Well, and, and I suppose the Germans, in some sense, would have been most prone to the temptations of the Luciferian intellect too, because right. they were extremely successful in their 
in their Towers of Babel. The figure of Faust looms very large in yeah. German art and literature, from obviously from Goethe onwards, but the, the Mephistophelian pact is just uh, really uh, fundamental to, to German culture and so German consciousness. You sell your soul to the devil, not so much for knowledge in some sense, but for power, right? And that can be technological power, but it's not knowledge. It's yeah, and it's all the other things that were being promised in the late 20s and early 30s in Germany, absolutely, yeah. But artistic power, power and it was it was the power in the elites. It was in the arts. It was in philosophy. It was in in music composition. It was well, in everything. You, you could also see that, given that Germany, in some sense, was at the pinnacle of that civilization, the fact that they were so profoundly defeated and then humil humiliated was also a, a what but that produces a wounded pride and narcissism, and and that's certainly part that's certainly part of the Luciferian spirit. So, but that that idea. Look, here's a, here's a good example of that. So when, when police were interviewing children when they were investigating the satanic daycare accusations back in the 1980s, the children would come up with absolutely hair-raising tales of satanic ritual abuse, like young children. You think, well, where do they get that? Well, often what would happen was that a child with a mother who is a paranoid schizophrenic or bordering on it would start to get delusional about what people might have been doing to her child when the, she left them in the daycare. Now she was guilty because she left them in the daycare and now, and now she's wondering, oh, well, I left my children with strangers. What could they be up to? And then because she was bordering on psychosis, she'd have these incredible delusional fantasies. And then being disturbed, she'd start to bother her children. It's like, Why, does anybody do anything to you? And children partly construct the way that they react to the world by looking at whether what they say grasps the attention of adults. And so, the child would be struggling to find the words that would satisfy the, satisfy the mother's curiosity and struggling with that. And then they'd go to sleep at night and have a dream. And the dream would get nightmarish. And that's because the dream was trying to model what it is that the mother was calling forth out of them. And then you could run that for a couple of weeks and the child would be telling all sorts of horrific stories. And then the police would come in and they'd investigate in relationship to the children, and they'd get even more grotesque and cat catastrophic fantasies out of the kids. And then they'd think, well, the kids couldn't be inventing this, but they weren't, they were co-inventing it. And this is what happened in some sense to Hitler under the sway of the German people. It's like he was willing, he was already, he had his flaws, many of them, right? Many, many, wounded narcissism being not paramount among them because he was also very orderly and disgust sensitive. Which and is so, funny because he had separating gums. So it's like, poor yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, well, right, right, right. Well, like he, was, he's, a, he was like, you know, vile in certain senses mm -hmm. and then overcoming it and scouring mm -hmm. rats well, he's a and worshiper a homeless of the, and slobs yes, and Jews exactly. with this, his own like disdain for his, you know, twisted well, psyche. And for his own mortality. Yeah. Right? And he was a worshiper of the will. He was perfectly proud that he could stand like this for hours and land in the back of a car. He regarded that as a signal signal evidence of his discipline and conscientiousness, you know? And so, and so, but in, in any case, you know, Hitler was willing to go exactly where the mob took him and was already motivated to go in a very dark direction. He'd been rejected, was it by the Vienna School of Art three times? He was a struggling street artist. He'd been brutalized by World War I. He was a decorated war hero. I think he was the only survivor of part of his platoon because a grenade blew up all of his friends when he was off doing something peripheral and and so he had a survivor's complex as well and an idea that he had a destiny because of that and then he was homeless as you pointed out and of course the communists were threatening germany at the time and there were reason to be paranoid about that and it was all set up for a perfect storm but hitler definitely allowed the mob to call forth the darkest fantasies possible out of the recesses so of his in, soul in light of that i'd like to read to you what heinrich heine the great german poet wrote uh, exactly a hundred years before Hitler came to power. And this is so relevant to our themes of, of the need for God and religion. So this is a, a secular Jew writing this, the great German poet Heine, Heinrich Heine. Christianity, and this is its greatest merit, has somewhat mitigated that brutal German love of war, but it could not destroy it. Should that subduing talisman, the cross, be shattered, the frenzied madness of the ancient warriors, that insane berserk rage of which Nordic bards have spoken and sung so often, will once more burst into flame. This talisman, the cross, 
is fragile, and the day will come when it will collapse miserably, then a play will be performed in Germany, which will make the French Revolution look like an innocent walk in the park. You know, the Wartburg, isn't that unbelievable? What, when was that written? 1834. Wow. wow. The, Wartburg the prophetic voice. is a very important building for German consciousness because it was where Luther hid away as um, Junker Jörg when he was um, <clears throat> uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, in danger. And he, and it was in the Wartburg that he threw the ink pot at the devil. Um, you can still see the bit of ink on the uh, in Luther's in Luther's cell. Um, and apparently, the in 1933, the Nazis tried to replace the cross because in the Wartburg there's always a cross um, fly a, a flag of uh, the, the, a flag of the cross flying. And in 1933, when the Nazis took power, they, they replaced the cross with the swastika. Mm -hmm. It's an anti-cross. The yeah. swastika is yeah. an anti-cross. And uh, the, the locals wouldn't have it. They had to take the swastika mm. down, uh, which, is, which is quite interesting in terms of this tension between the Christian inheritance, and of course, this was particularly associated with, with Luther, and then the attempt to, as it were, repress that Christian inheritance that you found, you know, among the Nazis, um, uh, particularly Himmler. But, um, you, Jordan, one of my favorite observations you've had is when you said, you know, if you're, if you're scared of strong men, you should be terrified of what weak men can do. Mm -hmm. And I always think about that with Hitler, such a great example mm -hmm. of that. Right. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, that bitterness and that resentment, that that feeling of that you know lack of positive masculinity, let's say, right of of integration. Well, and also and also in some sense, also no clear pathway forward. It wasn't like it was a picnic for ex-soldiers in Germany in the 1920s. So you know we always have to remember that a fair bit of his suffering, in some sense, was come by honestly. It was no joke to be in the trenches. It's no joke to have all your friends die. It's no joke to be homeless and rejected, you know? And so I'm not obviously justifying any of that because people can come out, out of that not being Hitler, let's say, but- But the power of a resentful populism is something bet, we should keep resentment, a, a very close eye on. Yeah, that's for sure, in, in every way, yeah. Resentment, I never saw anything among my clinical clients that was more destructive than resentment. And that's the spirit of Cain, right? That not only am I resentful, but it's justifiable. I can shake my fist at God and I have the right on my side. You know, it's, it's really, it's really, really not good. Maybe it's worse than pride. Or, yeah. And they're The only thing that competes right? with it is betrayal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, and you can't appeal to betrayal the way you can appeal to resentment. Right. right? You can suffer from betrayal, but you can appeal to resentment. So. Resentment justifies anything. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and that's also the underground motivation for resentment. Like if you're if you're possessed by the desire for power, you can certainly capitalize on your resentment. So, Dennis, can I ask very quickly? You just uh, started this fascinating phase of our discussion by talking about the way in which you think the Torah endorses some kind of notion of collective guilt. In in, in the way that yeah. that the. Jordan okay. Was talking about. Right. Yeah. So I just think there are two kinds. There's one that sort of, you know, collective guilt in the present, but the the debate that's really haunting the political landscape at the moment is, is the kind of right. whether there's a kind of diachronic. Oh, that has an answer. Oh, God, guilt. God bless you. That is a great distinction, and the Torah has an antidote. There is a law in the Torah. Law. It's a commandment from God Himself. You may not hate the Egyptians. Okay. Uh -huh. right, right. So that ends that whole issue. Egypt is no longer guilty. Whites are no longer guilty, if that's what you had in mind. And that's symbolized in ceremonially, 
with the drops of wine. That, yeah, what, right. Did I mention that on it? Uh, 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 yeah. okay. I didn't? No, no. Okay, so very quickly, at the, at the Passover Seder, and as I noted, it's universal. It's not, it was not at all specific to my family or community. When the 10 plagues are listed at the Passover Seder, the, the Jew puts the pinky into the cup of wine. We drink four cups of wine. Those who can handle it, I can't. And, and you, you remove some wine with each plague as your way of saying, I'm not going to increase but decrease my happiness over their suffering. So there's no schadenfreude there. Right. Uh, I'm, the tradition is better than me. If I did 10 plagues over Germany, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I would dip my finger in. Mm -hmm. When I read about the bombings if, if of you Germany, don't have sympathy, I'm, I'm you very don't, torn. If you don't have sympathy for that, it's very difficult to understand it. You know, meaning one of the things I tried to do when I was reading about the Nazi atrocities is I tried to imagine myself as an Auschwitz guard who enjoyed it. And that takes sympathy. It's a very dangerous thing to do, you know, and no one wants to do that because when people read about the Holocaust, they want to think, well, they'd be a victim or they'd be a hero, a redeeming hero. It's like statistically, well, maybe you'd be a victim, but the probability you'd be a redeeming hero in the face of the mm -hmm. Hitlerian nightmare is I think it's, it's the, only, the only inoculation that one would have to not do that, to say, I'd be the one who'd get out of line and stand with the Jews and be executed, is if, I believe, is if you know that you in all likelihood would not be that person. Right, right. Then you have a chance. Yeah. That's I right, that's I right. I wrote a, a screenplay, I was adapted a, a wonderful book called Black Flags. Uh, it won the Pulitzer by Joby Wark. It's spectacular. It's about Zarkalway. And Zarkalway was, in many regards, incredibly flawed, horrifying, monstrous genius, right? He revolutionized uh, terror, terrorism, basically. He had a big plan for to drop a chemical bomb on Amun, and it was the Mukbara got ahead of it. And so he figured he could kidnap one American tourist and saw his head off, right, Nick Berg. And in doing so, he made sure it was recorded in a particular way that broadband was just becoming accessible in the U.S. And he made sure it was exactly released in a format that it could go the most widely to the U.S. to have the biggest impact. And it's the lowest resources. He personalized terror. And one of my thesis when I was writing about him was that, you know, he's like Steve Jobs, right? He, Steve Jobs looked at a phone long enough until it was no longer a phone. He was transformative. There's something that was godlike in his ability to figure out exactly the most excruciating forms of terrorism. He was so bad that, that bin Laden apologized for him. And every two weeks, because when you're writing a character, you have to inhabit them. The, the goal is to pull on their mask and see the world through their eye holes. And every two weeks, I would watch again, when I was writing this, the beheading. And it was horrifying. I mean, my whole, it's like that full body sweat. Revulsion. like her, Yeah, and it's, it's horrifying. And the sound of it. But it was like, I'm not going to lose myself in moral relativism, right? But I'm writing from him. I have to write from his position of where he came from and how he was radicalized and what about him was brilliant, right? And what campaign and what his grievances were. But I, I had, I kept mooring myself in that. I, you go back and watch that again. And it's like, it's, it's inconceivable almost to witness mm -hmm. once, let alone. But I think that's part of what you're saying about trying well, to find... Well, I think it's also part of that motif of taking the world's sins upon yourself. It's like, well, people did this, and you're a person. And you think, well, no, I couldn't. It's like, don't be so sure about that. And then maybe there's something even worse, which is, if you're so sure you couldn't do it. You might be so sure you couldn't do it in precise proportion to the degree that you would be vulnerable to do it if the situation was right. Like Germany in the 1930s, so evolved, mm -hmm. right? Right, exactly. So wondrously evolved. It's yeah. the last place something like that could happen. It's like, right. nope, it's the only place that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's what they so, always ask. How could the country that produced Beethoven, Goethe, and Schiller produce Auschwitz? Mm -hmm. I, I, I resonate to the question, and I don't resonate to the question, because... The, I would say of the 10 saddest revelations of my life, and this was one of the first, it, because I'm crazy about classical music. It, it's it's mm. deeply important to my life. And I had to make peace with the fact that you could love Mozart and build Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. it, it hurt me terribly. Well, that's the, I, that's I really the... thought it makes you better to love Bach. Yeah, well, that's the whole realm of the human experience, though, isn't it? That that spans the entire 
range. And, you know, part of that, that Christian idea that the Savior of the world takes the sins upon himself, that really means to encompass that entire span and then to try to reconcile it. And the span is stretches, what does Jung say? A tree that wants to reach up into heaven has to grow its roots all the way into hell. And I think that's really true because how, how can you defeat the devil without understanding him? And if the devil's in your heart, then you have to understand that in your heart. It's your only inoculation. It's your only inoculation. You mean to see yourself going there and then decide not to, or see well, how you could go there. Well, also to engage with it in a way that doesn't make it wholly Other. alien to you. Right, right. Right, the inoculation is to try to engage with it in some manner. And so in the process of the writing is, it, this is very intimate when you're, when I'm writing something, I'm in it 24 seven. And so if I'm writing this story, the inoculation, it's like going in to try and understand well, and it. Your but books have got better and better, and I would say more and more successful as your villains have got more and more human. Not that they're any, they're not, they're not better villains in the moral sense. They're worse and worse, right. but they're well, also that, more know. and more understandable and human. And that makes them much more terrifying, strangely enough. I think I had to grow up enough to realize that, that antagonists and protagonists are much more compelling than villains and heroes. Because I started... Well, sorry, sorry, just about, about your, your reflection about... Um, Mozart and, and and Goethe for that matter. And by Wagner. the way, Goethe was a, was a, was a um, an anti nationalist. I mean, he's. <laughs> I mean, Goethe was was at a time where German nationalism was very important. He was very hostile to the to the idea, and I think one has to remember the extent of German resentment going through the centuries, and this was partly to do with the. The, the Holy Roman Empire and and what they call the Kleinstaatlerei, the the uh, very divided nature of the uh, the German regions, and for that reason, their sense of vulnerability, and you had that. Um, that sense that at the Reformation, Germany had been divided. Then you have Germany at the mercy of very powerful neighboring nation, particularly France, so the humiliation by France under, under Louis the, the 14th. Then Napoleon, um, many of those who died in, in Napoleon's Russian campaign were Germans. Um, the, the Bavarians in particular, but the large numbers. So the Germans had this long-standing feeling that they were weak, that they were humiliated. So the First World War comes on the back of this long centuries sense of being um, humiliated, abused, and a deep sense of resentment. The idea that French is the cultured language that French, I mean, the German aristocracy, they would, they, they would speak French to each other, you know. French was, of course, the language of, of, of the court. Uh, Frederick the Great's castle was called Sans Souci. Uh, you know, he thought German, the greatest, you know, the king of Prussia thought German was a pretty nasty language, really. So I think, I think your point about resentment, resentment in the soul mm -hmm. as being this deeply poisonous and transformative power uh, is, is, yeah, well, is very significant this, in this The story this of Cain is so unbelievably yeah, powerful yeah. because... So it's not just how does this amazingly sophisticated, scientifically brilliant poetic, the land of Dichter und Denker, the land of poets and thinkers, how did it suddenly become so satanic? It's also a long history of resentment and, and feeling of being humiliated, and we need to take our place. Well, resentment well. also, it's, resentment's a real rough one, too, because it's, it's really easy to confuse with the desire for justice, right? And there is a desire for justice and a need for it, and, but resentment perverts the the sense of justice, it, it, it perverts it to your own ends because it, it perverts justice to the, what, the designs of revenge, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that revenge can become, really, it becomes cosmic. I, I mean, I've read a lot about, I've read a lot about the thinking and, and writing of serial killers and people who shot up high schools and that kind of thing. And what you see is that the deeper the crime, the more cosmic the resentment. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really the case. It gets to the point where the only language you can use to describe the motivation is satanic. And often the perpetrators themselves use that language, right? Well, they think how impersonal, being possessed. impersonal your anger has to be, how cosmic it has to be to slaughter a school full of people who you hardly mm -hmm. know. 
Stephen, I feel like, has been our, our Jiminy Cricket of conscience pointing out the, the, the choice, the constant choice, and with the Pharaoh and the strengthening. And one of the other things I'm thinking about so much as we're regarding this text, which is no matter, it, it's a holy text, right? No matter whether that's a capital H or a lowercase h, depending on how people go to it. And one of the ways to engage with any text of meaning, we were talking yesterday about Rogerian listening, right? Where you engage at the nervous system. And part of it is, is when we're reading this, part of what we're doing is practicing the question, I think, Dennis, that you're raising, because we, we all also have to be the Pharaoh, in some regards, if you're going to engage with a text, right? One of the jobs of, of writing or carving, right? Or creating any kind of art is like, I think about Caravaggio all the time where some minor player in the background has, is fully three-dimensionalized. Um, we're not just meant to be the role of Moses when we're reading this. We're meant to also embrace and engage and see the Pharaoh in ourselves. And that's something like you keep bringing that back to the personal and psychological also. And I think that that's that notion of the inoculating factor is why are we spending so much time with somebody who's so stubborn that he keeps hardening his heart and people are dying and all this happens. It's like, that's us also, right? And just like in- And it's also the thing in us that keeps us from ser- from claiming the freedom that allows us to serve God properly. So he's really the antithetical enemy. And you can say, well, the, what the biblical corpus does in large part is walk you through all the domains of mankind. It's right. Here's the whole panoply of the possible right. human experience. Embody them all. all Listen them. to yes. them, like, attend like, to them. Like they're you. Like, yeah, as Rogers did. Mm-hmm. Open yeah. your, soften yourself to the vulnerability of encountering well, it all it also them. lets the text speak to you. You know, I think part of the reason that the first biblical series I did was serious was because I approached the text as if it might have something to teach me. That was the a priori presumption, right? Which is what you have to do if you read a text that's written by great thinkers, too. It's like, well, well, Nietzsche's a good example. It's like, well, that was Nietzsche, you know? You might give some credence to the notion that there's something in there to learn. And maybe you don't take all of it. You can take, what, the right spoils from the Egyptians mm-hmm. in the service of the right thing. And maybe you leave some of, of what's there behind. And so, and so, but, but that, that, in the in the passion story mm. which what it's doing in part is it's taking you through all of that all at once right because you're you're a pilot who says what is truth and you're the tyrannical roman and you're the mob that calls for the death of the innocent and, and you're you, washing your hands you bet yeah. you bet and you have to be as well as being the suffering person who's right. taking all of this on and, and all of that has to be equally real Maybe then you decide which of those characters you'd rather be aligned with, you know. And well, the practice of this right now, part of what, like you were talking about, Dennis, earlier, that everything's a miracle. The birth of an ant is a miracle. Like us being or having this discussion, we're increasingly in a culture where our engagement with things is so bifurcated we're not allowed to even engage with with the, the there's no conceivable notion to engage with the full perspective of of the other side and there's a hundred ways that define that beyond just the obviously red and blue and it's like we keep and and so much of well, what if you engaging, demonize the other you don't have to embody it that's right that's convenient you dehumanize man. it's not a part of you mm-hmm. and so much of what the study of text is what the study of story is is, a, is, a, is 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 that form of an inoculation for your own individuation. The that's what we're that, doing here. That's is, right. The, well, that's what should happen in a humanities education is that, no, no, you have to embody all these characters. Right. So, well, gentlemen, that's probably, that seems like a meat place to stop, I would say. We've run out our two hours and so, and we got through a lot of material and I was wondering at the beginning of this, well, we'll probably just zip through the plagues because there's this repetition and it turns out, well, just as you'd expect that if you pay enough attention to the text, there's nothing to run through quickly. All right, so thank you everyone for who's watching and listening and thank you once again to the Daily Wire crew for setting this up and to all of you for taking the time and effort necessary in this really miraculous occurrence, I would say, and I really do view it that way. It's unbelievably unlikely that we've been able to assemble ourselves like this and to be able to talk like this and to be able to bring this to the attention of many, many people. And it, you know, it's, it's very uh, appropriate not to underestimate the likelihood of something like that occurring and being appreciative of it, as I think we all are in a very deep sense. And also to the people who, the technical people and everyone whose faith in this unlikely venture has made it possible. And it's not the 
gratitude a part of the genuinely religious mind in the way that resentment is a part of... of it's yeah, the yeah, opposite yeah. of... Yeah. Gratitude is yeah. the opposite of resentment. Yeah, it's what's why you want to practice it as a virtue. It's like, what do I have to be grat grateful for? <laughs> Look at my suffering. It's like, well, it's incumbent upon you to discover that which you should be grateful for. Yeah, it's, especially if you're suffering, you know? Especially if you're suffering, we really learned that with with Michaela is to try to find it's like in all that pain to try to find what you can hold on to that's real in the midst of that, and you know, that's certainly that's an orientation towards gratitude. You move yeah. towards where you put your attention. I mean, that's exactly what we're right, 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 right. Discussing the all gratitude right. is also maybe a note tend on because I think this is Douglas's last. Uh, session with us this time around. Yes, yes. I do believe that we're going to rekindle this. This is no, this is August right now, our end of July. And I do believe we plan to rekindle this in January because we won't get through the whole book. And yes, it's been absolutely wonderful having you here and a real privilege to have you come here. And it's also been, for all of you who are listening, it's been ridiculously fun. We've been jet skiing around on the ocean in Miami. And so when we're not studying the <laughs> book of Exodus, and eating steaks and drinking bourbon, not me, even though I'd like to. Anyways, Douglas, thank you very much for coming. And uh, it's, been, it's been great to have you here and look forward to having you here again, for sure. So. Look forward to it.